estamos muy orgullosos de mostrar en su cumpleaños. Que le vamos a dar un Eso también es un concierto para para
as we all know, there's two types of orbits, the Julia set. Now, because we're dealing with the entire function, the Julia set of e to the z is the closure of the set of points that escape to infinity. Not like in the polynomial case where it's the boundary of things in escape, it's the closure of things in escape. Anything that goes to infinity is in the Julia set. But just as before, it's also the closure of the set of repelling periodic points. And so immediately you see that the Julia set is the chaotic set, because arbitrarily close to any point in the Julia set is a point that goes off to infinity, and also arbitrarily close is another point that comes right back to itself. So you get chaotic behavior. And then the Fatou set is the complement of the Julia set, as we've heard several times, that's the place where things are basically okay. Okay, lambda e to z, again with lambda less than or equal to 1 over e. Okay, when lambda is less than 1 over e, the graph of the exponential looks like this on the real line. You see that it crosses the diagonal twice, one time at a fixed point that's attracting. I'll call that attracting fixed point Q. Okay, and notice that the orbit of zero, okay, that's the important orbit here, the orbit of zero tends to that attracting fixed point. Pretty lambda less than 1 over e as the case. We also have a repelling fixed point. I'll call that P. Notice that any point to the right of P just keeps iterating further and further away. It goes off to infinity. And then thirdly, notice that there's a point in between. I'll call it X0. That's the point where the derivative is 1. And notice the exponential of X0 moves closer to the origin. E to the X0 is less than X0. And notice that the derivative now is less than 1 any place to the left of x0. OK, so where is the Julia set? Well, let's draw that vertical line through x0. What happens to that line when we exponentiate? Well, you all know when you take the exponential of the vertical line, it wraps around the circle infinitely often around the origin. Which circle? Well, remember, x0 exponentiates closer to 0. So the image of that circle, that vertical line, will be a circle, which is wrapped around infinitely often. Okay? So everything to the left of this line is mapped inside this disk. Vertical lines further to the left are mapped with smaller circles. Okay? So that means that this disk is contracted inside itself all points in that disk tend to Q. So they're not in the Julia set. They just tend to that attracting fixed point. But now everything to the left of this vertical line maps into that disk. So everything down here also tends to that fixed point. So those points are in the Fatu set. They're not in the Julia set. What else is not in the Julia set? Well, think of the line y equals pi, 3 pi, 5 pi, etc. Where is y equals pi map? Under the exponential, that's mapped to the negative real axis. So all these points are green. They're in the Fatou set. And now there's got to be some little neighborhood of each of these lines that are mapped onto the left-hand half plane. So all of those points get mapped to the left-hand half plane and then down to the attractive fixed point there in the Fatou set. Okay, you see these white regions here? Those white regions are in fact mapped to the right-hand half uh, plane. So these green fingers mapped to the left, the white fingers are mapped to the right. So that means each of these white regions has, is mapped over this finger, that finger, that finger, etc. So we can remove infinitely many other fingers in each of those white regions. And then on and on and on. This little finger here is mapped to one of the bigger fingers. Remove infinitely many little green things there and keep doing it. And when you're done, what you're left with is the complement. The set of points that don't map into to that fixed point, or tend to that fixed point, is a collection of curves, or what we'll call hairs, in the right hand top plane, each of which has an endpoint and a stem. And that's the complement of the Fatou set. That's the Julia set. Looks pretty simple. Wait. Okay. 
see a couple pictures of it. Now I painted the Fatu set in black. I have color points here in the uh, junior set. Those are points that escape to infinity. We have this really, as we just said, a collection of curves there. You don't sort of see curves here. That's because the algorithm we use. We just check whether something exponentiates to the right hand power plane further than 100 or something. Uh, and in fact, also those curves are packed so closely together that you can even see them if we try to draw it accurately. In any event, as usual, uh, and this is the Cantor bouquet, by the way, the Julian set. If you look at it, you sort of see a fist with infinitely many fingers coming out of it. If you zoom in on that region, see again a fist with infinitely many fingers coming out of it, a fist with infinitely many fingers coming out of it. As usual, these Julian sets are fractals. Okay. Now, as I said, the Julian set consists of this infinite set of hairs. One of those hairs lies on the real axis. Because remember, we had that repelling fixed point right here, and then all the points to the right just went off to infinity. So that's the end point of this hair on the real axis, the stem. All points on the stem go to infinity, and the end, end point in this case is the repelling fixed point. And now, that's in fact what happens in general. If you take one of these stems, what happens is if you take a point on the stem, that orbit's going to bounce around and go from different stem to different stem, and that orbit's going to go off to infinity. I'm not going to prove that, but that's actually easy to see. So all of the orbits of points on the stems tend to infinity. That means that the set of bounded orbits must lie in the set of endpoints. But remember, the repelling cycles are bound orbits. So they must lie in the set of endpoints. But then remember, the Julia set is the closure of the set of repelling cycles. So that means this picture is wrong. Those repelling cycles have to be everywhere. They have to be close to any point in the Julia set. So those repelling cycles are everywhere, and they're the endpoints of a stem. They're all attached to a stem. So it's getting a little bit more complicated. In fact, it's really crazy. Okay, here's some facts. The first fact is that if you try to reach in and touch this Julia set from somewhere in the Fatou set, okay, the only points you're going to hit first point you're going to get is always an end point. You can't reach in and touch one of those stems. Those end points are everywhere. Okay. In fact, the way to really see that is this basin of the attractive fixed point Q is a simply connected set. So from complex analysis, we have a Riemann map that takes the interior of the unit disk to this black region. Okay. And even though this Julia set is this collection of curves coming into a competitor, even though the Julia set is not locally connected, all the rays in this Riemann map length. By that I mean if you take a straight ray and take the image under the Riemann map, that's going to land on some point. It's going to land maybe at an end point, as we said here, but it's never going to land on one of those stems. You can't reach in and touch one of those stems. You'd have to hit one of the end points first. But of course, the image of this ray could, in fact, go off to infinity in any of these directions. So all rays land, but only at their end points or <coughs> at infinity. A little strange. But here's some crazy facts. Okay. First fact is this. Let's look at the set of endpoints. And let's put that now in the Riemann sphere. Okay, let's look at the set of endpoints, union, the point at infinity. That turns out to be a connected set. It's one piece. The set of endpoints, union, infinity is one piece. Now, by a theorem of Mayer, let's remove one point. Let's remove the point at infinity from this set. 
the resulting stats is totally disconnected. Think about that. You've got a connected set. You pull out one point. Yeah, you're going to get a disconnected set, maybe with infinitely many pieces. But I'm saying more. You pull out one point, you get a totally disconnected set. You get a set that's just a scatter of points, little points touch. You put one point in, and that set is suddenly connected to one piece. You say to a, poly to a topologist, wait a minute, that sounds a little strange. They say, well, no, that happens all the time. <laughs> Here's another thing. This Julia set consists of two pieces, the stems and the endpoints. Which is the larger piece? Well, obviously, it's the set of stems, right? If it's corresponding to any single endpoint, you've got a whole half line. Well, Borussia Karpinska decided to check that. She computed the Hausdorff dimension of those two sets. What she found was that the Hausdorff dimension of a set of stems was one. Of course, it's an infinite collection of curves. But the Hausdorff dimension of the set of endpoints was larger. In fact, it was two. Think about that. You've got this set of endpoints and this much larger set of stems, but the set of endpoints is really much larger. It has Hausdorff dimension over. Two factorial. We had the Hausdorff dimension two factorial. <laughs> right? As opposed to the stems, which is much smaller. So everything you think you know about this simple collection of curves is just totally wrong. It's really a crazy set. OK. Uh, well, let's, uh, since some people here have worked on the sine function, let's just look at our, the lambda sine z. Now, again, for simplicity, let me let lambda be real in between 0 and 1. There's the Julia set for lambda sine z. Looks like an infinite collection of snowmen. Mexico, you have no idea what's going on. From the Boston, I'll show you. <laughs> okay. Okay. What's that? Okay. You said, yeah, okay, you see the snowman. <laughs> Usually, snowmen are white, but I painted it black. <laughs> so, you can see the snowmen have arms, and baby arms that have little pimples on them. I can see it in the structure. But in fact, this is also a canter bouquet. Okay, but unlike the exponential case, these curves act much more closely together. That's why you don't see as much of the avenues as we saw for the exponential case. Okay, the reason is, as McMullen showed, the Julia set for the exponential is Lebesgue measure zero, but the Lebesgue measure of these two cantor case, the sine function, is in fact infinite. They're the same topologically, the measure theory. Okay, so how do you produce a cantor bouquet for lambda sine z when lambda is less than 1? Now, well, think about sine on the real line. It takes the whole real, well, it takes, let's take a lot of sine between plus and minus pi over 2. Lambda sine x maps that to the interval between minus pi and pi. But in fact, the entire, and, oh, and, and then I should say that, uh, so it contracted inside itself, so all these green points now tend to the attracting fixed point at zero. Lambda less than one sine x is an attracting fixed point at zero. So all of those tend to be attracting fixed point. But now all of the real line maps inside this disk. So all of those points are in the Fatu set as well. And if you know the sine function, if you take the lines y uh, the vertical lines are pi over 2 minus pi over 2 minus pi over 2 plus pi. All of those are mapped either to the right part of the real line or to the left part of the real line. So all of those have to be colored green as well. And if you take a horizontal line, y equals c, where c is relatively small, what you can check is the sign takes that and wraps it infinitely often around an ellipse whose foci are the points plus and minus lambda. And as long as c is small, that means it's mapped much closer inside. So all of those points inside that ellipse actually tend to zero as well. So just like we saw for the exponential, all of those points are in the tattoo set.
but this entire strip is mapped to that ellipse. So all of those points are in the flat 2 set as well. And then remember we had those vertical lines, pi equals 2, 3 pi equals 2, etc. All of those map into the real line. So there's got to be regions in between here that are mapped to the lower half plane or to the upper half plane. Okay, and there's also got to be green regions that are mapped onto the back of the strip. You see the exact same structure as before. Each of these green fingers is mapped to the horizontal strip in the Fatu set. Each of these white fingers is mapped to the upper or lower top plane. So there's got to be infinitely many points in here that are mapped to that finger, to that finger, to that finger. So we can remove all of those and over and over again. And what we get is a pair of Cantor bouquets for the sine function. So this kind of Cantor bouquet comes up a lot of, in many different ways in the study of transcendental functions. Okay. So there's basically the same picture. Okay, now let me move to uh, the second example. In the composable continuum, okay, for simplicity, we'll stay with lambda e to the z, but now I'm going to let lambda be greater than 1 over e. This is joint work with a couple of people, uh, one of whom is Monica Moreno Roche, in case you haven't seen her before. <laughs> I'm so bad at me. <laughs> but then again, she was always mad at me. She was always great. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So let's move to indecomposable continuum. Before lambda was less than or equal to 1 over e, now lambda is larger than 1 over e. What happens on the real line is before, remember we had those two fixed points. When lambda equals 1 over e, those two fixed points come together on the real line. And then when lambda is larger than 1 over e, the graph is above the diagonal. So those two fixed points come together and they disappear from the real line, but actually move off into the complex point. This is a saddle node bifurcation, as we call it. Okay? Looks pretty simple, but now when lambda is greater than 1 over e, remember 0 goes off to infinity. Before 0 was attracted to that attractive fixed point, now 0 goes to infinity. 0 is the special point because that's the emitted value for the exponential. Plays the same role as critical values do for polynomial math. Now, this, uh, x, this omitted value goes off to infinity. And what happens is the Julius set explodes. You just do an animation of this. Here we get lambda just a little bit less than 1 over e. As I change lambda, still a candidate of decay, but then suddenly, boom, the Julius set explodes. In fact, it becomes the entire complex plane when lambda is larger than 1 over e. You see some black regions in there. That's because we're not using infinitely many iterations. Actually, as soon as lambda is uh, greater than 1 over e, the junior set becomes the entire complex plane and there's color everywhere. Quite a different bifurcation. When you look at it from the real line, you see a simple saddle bifurcation. When you go to the complex plane, the junior set changes dramatically. Okay, this is a theorem of uh, Dennis Sullivan, Lisa Goldberg, and Ben Keen. The theorem is if the orbit of zero, the exponential, that uh, omitted value, or what's known as the asymptotic value, if that orbit goes to infinity, then necessarily the Julius set is the entire complex plane. So that's what causes that amazing bifurcation. So if lambda goes through 1 over e, Suddenly, the Julia set goes from being that single little candy K in the right hand out plane to the entire complex plane. But no new periodic points are born. All of those periodic points just vary continuously so that when lambda is greater than or is less than or equal to 1 over e, they're all in the right hand out plane. But as soon as you get a lambda value larger than 1 over e, those periodic points are everywhere. They're dense in the whole complex plane. They move continuously to fill up densely the complex plane. And in my sense, more importantly, infinitely many of those hairs suddenly go from being simple curves to the indecomposable continuum. So what's an indecomposable continuum? If you've ever heard of this, 
and basically, by definition, an indie composed in continuum is a compact, connected set that cannot be divided, broken up, into the union of two proper, compact, connected sets. Okay? Say that again. You've got a compact, connected set in the plane. You can't write it as the union of two proper, compact, connected sets. I don't mean disjoint compact, connected sets. I mean overlapping compact, connected sets. So, for example, is the unit interval an indecomposable continuum? No way, I can break that up into two compact connected sets going from zero, say, two thirds, and from one third to one. I've written that as a union of two compact connected sets, not an indecomposable continuum. What about you? Are you indecomposable? That's right. I think you are. I brought, home, I brought along an axe with me on the plane. I can prove that you're not indecomposable. I can break you into two compact connected subsets. Prove that. They don't need that much. Okay. Or you want me to prove that with somebody else. I can do that too. What about the Sharpinsky triangle? Is that an indecomposable continuum? No way. I can break that into the top Sharpinsky triangle, closed connected set, and the bottom two Sharpinsky triangles. They overlap at two points there, and this set is connected because it has that point in common. So yeah, no, that's not uh, an indecomposable continuum. That's decomposable. What is an example of an indecomposable continuum? Well, the simplest possible example is what's known as the canaster continuum. Okay, and here's how you construct that. You start with the cantor middle third set, say on the real axis of the plane between 0 and 1. And now, that cantor middle third set is symmetric about the point 1 half. So what I'll do is connect any two symmetrically located points with a semicircle in the upper half plane. OK. Well, now over here on the right, you see another smaller copy of the cantor set, symmetric about this point here. I'll do the same. I'll connect any symmetrically located points here with semicircles that lie in the lower half plane. And then there's another cantor set here. Do the same thing there, and on and on and on. And in the limit, we've got what's called the canaster continuum. Okay, now this is a kind of crazy set as well for a number of reasons. First off, there's, there's a whole bunch of curves here going through those points in the canvas set, but there's one curve that passes through all the endpoints in the canvas in the third set. Look at this set. It's a curve that starts at zero, goes over to one, to two thirds, to one third, to two ninths, seven ninths, eight ninths, one ninth, the twenty seventh, the eighty first. There's one curve that passes through all those endpoints of the canvas set. And so, wait a minute, the endpoints are dense in the camber side. So this curve accumulates on everywhere, including itself. Even any endpoint in there, there's infinitely many endpoints nearby. So this curve accumulates everywhere on the, on the canaster continuum, as well as on itself. Okay? And moreover, it's the only piece of the canaster continuum that's accessible from the outside. Again, if you reach in and try to touch a piece of the canaster continuum, the first piece you're going to hit, the first point you're going to hit, is on this accessible curve. You can't reach the others. But in fact, as we all know, there's infinitely many other curves, infinitely many other buried points in this canter set, points that aren't endpoints. Those all have curves running through them that, in fact, are dense in the canaster continuum. And then this accessible curve accumulates everywhere on them. And then finally, this set is compact and connected, easy to prove, and indecomposable. Okay, I'm not going to prove that by the apologist, which is true. Okay, but just think about it. Could, can we divide this into two proper compact connected sets? For example, can we break it up into the region inside this blue rectangle and the region inside the green rectangle? Well, what's inside the blue rectangle is a closed set, but it's clearly not connected. Same thing over here. So that doesn't work. How about breaking it up into the top piece of the green rectangle and the bottom piece? Again, those are closed sets, but this region down here in the blue piece is not connected. 
can't do it that way. How about breaking it up into that one accessible curve that goes through all the endpoints, and then all the other curves in the master continuum? Can we do that? Well, that's two different sets, but they're not closed. Right? Remember, this outer curve accumulates everywhere. It's closed as the whole set. So that wasn't a closed set. So you can't do it that way. So this is an incomposable continuum. So now let me show you how those hairs that we saw earlier, when lambda was less than or equal to 1 over 8, suddenly become incomposable continuum. When lambda was less than 1 over 8, remember they had that one stem on the real axis. There was a repelling fixed point right there, and to its left, there was an attracting fixed point. <clears throat> and as lambda approached 1 over e, those two fixed points came together and then suddenly disappeared. And when lambda was uh, greater than 1 over e, suddenly all points on the real line went to infinity. In fact, those two fixed points reappeared as repelling fixed points in the upper and lower uh, planes. So this hair, there was a half line suddenly becomes a whole line when lambda is greater than one. But in fact, it's much longer. Because think, what is the pre-image of this, uh, the line, the horizontal <coughs> x-axis? Well, one pre-image lies up here along the line y equals pi. y equals pi under the exponential is mapped to the negative uh, real line. So I can think of this curve as going out to infinity in the plane, the Riemann sphere, attach that point at infinity, and come back here, a much longer curve. But now what's the set of points that map to y equals pi? It's the free image of that set. Well, I claim it's a set that looks like this. And the reason is, if I took a vertical line right here, and exponentiated it, and I get a small semicircle. So that vertical line wouldn't get this line here. Because if I keep moving these vertical lines to the right, I eventually reach a vertical line, which when I exponentiate it, moves into a semicircle that just touches y equals pi. So there's one point here that maps to y equals pi. And then if I move this vertical line further to the right and exponentiate it, I get back to a larger semicircle that hits y equals pi twice. So there's two points that get that y equals pi. So the pre-image of y equals pi is this. So now I can think of this hair as being longer. Go out to infinity, come back along y equals pi, go out to infinity, come back along this curve, go out to infinity, etc. An even longer curve. And now the pre-image of that curve looks like that, pre-image of that curve looks like that, etc. You see these pre-images are accumulating down on the real axis. Okay. But that means that if I keep doing this, since the y equals pi is mapped to the real axis, these curves will accumulate there, and then accumulate here, and accumulate there. I keep doing this, I get a curve, right? Well, let me compactify everything. Let me put it into a compact region in a plane, and then identify those two points, those two points, those two points, those two points. I get a curve that accumulates everywhere on itself, just like that outer curve that you can ask for continuum. Okay, and there's a theory of topology that you have a plane, a curve, a planar curve that accumulates everywhere on itself. The closure of that set is an incomposable continuum. So as we go through lambda equals one over e, our hair is still a half line, but as soon as lambda is greater than one over e, suddenly that curve changes into one of these incomposable continuum. Okay? Now, it turns out that the topology of this continuum, as we just saw, is kind of complicated, but the dynamics is pretty simple. Remember, there was one repelling fixed point that emerged up in the upper half line. There's a repelling fixed point in there. All other orbits in this canastic continuum either tend to infinity or they accumulate on the orbit of zero and infinity. If I think of a point on this curve here in the continuum, that maps there, maps there, maps there, maps there, maps to the real axis, and then goes off to infinity. So all points on these curves I've drawn have orders that just go to infinity. But now when we close this up, there's all sorts of other stuff in there. If I can ask the continuum, all those curves that didn't go through the endpoint, they're there as well. 
what happens to those points is they go out near infinity, go very far near minus infinity, go back very close to zero, and then do it again. Go even further out to infinity, further near minus infinity, go back very close to zero. So those other points all accumulate on the orbit of zero and infinity. So the dynamics is pretty simple. But the topology is not at all understood. What's the topology of this indecomposable continuum? What we think is, for each different lambda greater than 1 over e, you get an indecomposable continuum that's topologically different from every other one. It's entirely possible, or a reason topology, to show that it have a continuum of indecomposable continuum. And we think that's what's happening here, however we don't understand the topology at all. Now, maybe do something with sine. Okay, remember for sines, lambda sines, you get a pair of, of uh, candle k's in the Julia set. Okay. Let me look at now one plus lambda i sine z, let lambda vary, okay? When lambda is non-zero, suddenly the Julia set of one plus lambda i sine z changes dramatically. Let me show you that uh, with a little animation. I'm going to look at one plus ci sine z. There we are when c, when c is zero, but suddenly, ooh, you see an explosion. And again, you see some black points there. Very often, they're not there because I'm only using a finite number of iterations. But you can see these spirals of crossing right there and right there. And what's happening when that, when they cross is our C value is actually going through a small copy of the Mandelbrot set. So in fact, the Julia set isn't the entire complex plane when something like that happens right there. There's actually a small piece of the quadratic Julia set that infinitely many of them. So this is a very different bifurcation, though we know from many values of C, the Julia set is on the entire plane. So the question is, when that Julia set becomes the entire plane, do we still have any proposal continuous in the exponential case? And if we do, what's the topology there? Big difference for the exponential that are many values. For sine, we have critical points. Infinitely many critical points. They are only two critical points because there's two critical values. We are only one because the critical values behave symmetrically. Critical points are different from the asymptotic from the values. Okay, one last uh, uh, one example, Schpinski curves. Now I'm going to move to a family of rational maps z to the n plus lambda over z to the n, where n is greater than or equal to 2, and lambda here is a parameter. We study these families because we think of this as a singular perturbation of z to the n. We know what happens to z to the n very easy. But now, with lambda be small and non-zero, you've got a singular perturbation of z to the n. Suddenly, the genius sets change. This is joint work with a number of people. Uh, would you like to see a picture of one of them? So, okay. But if you want to see it, I can show it So, Shapinsky curves. What's a Shapinsky curve? Well, a Shapinsky curve is any plane or set. It's homeomorphic to the well-known Shapinsky carpet. I'm sure you've all seen the Shapinsky carpet. Start with the unit disk, right? With the unit square in the plane break it up into nine equal size subsquares and remove the open middle square. That leaves you with eight squares, do the same. We break it up into nine pieces, remove the open middle piece, and do this on and on and on. You get what's known as the Schapinski carpet fractal. A Schapinski curve is any plane of set that's only brought into the carpet. Most people think the important, most important plane of fractal is the Schrapinski triangle or Dastro. That's totally wrong. This is easily the most important planar fractal for a number of reasons. Okay? The first reason is, uh, well, these things show up all the time as Julia sets for rational maps. Right? All of these sets here look different, but 
but in fact, they're all homeomorphic to the coverage. That's one reason these sets are important. Okay, a second reason is, by the theorem of Weiberg in the 50s, there's actually a topological characterization of any set that's homeomorphic to the coverage. Remember, I said all those Julia sets were homeomorphic to the coverage. Could I construct a homeomorphism from one of those pictures uh, back here to the carpet? No way. But to show that there's a homeomorphism, I just have to prove that those sets have come with all of these five properties. I have to show that any kind of set, I to show that any kind of set that's compact and connected, locally connected, and nowhere dense, and has the property that any pair of complementary domains bounded by single closed curves that are disjoint. Okay, and look at the Michigan's power that has that property. For example, take any complementary domains, maybe this one and that one, bounded by simple closed curves of squares that are pairwise <coughs> disjoint. Okay, it's easy to check. We're just removing a bunch of open disks here. The uh, Shapinsky carpet is compact and connected. And then a little bit of work shows that it's locally connected and nowhere dense. But if you're an expert in complex dynamics, you know that showing four and a half of these properties is trivial when you look at the Julia set. So it's easy to show that certain Julia <coughs> sets are Shapinsky curves. And, and here's the final reason why the carpet is so important. It's what we call a universal plane continuum. What that means is that if you give me any planar, one-dimensional, one topological dimensional, compact connected set in the plane, that can be homeomorphically manipulated to fit right inside the Shapinsky carpet. Okay, but think of this as meaning just any compact curve in the plane. Okay, any compact curve in the plane, I can change that, you know, without making it cross, so that it fits inside the Shapinsky for example, you see the topologist sine curve in the Shapinsky carpet? It's got to be able to fit there. Well, let's talk about the topologist sine curve is sine 1 over x. Okay. Let me homeomorphically make that piecewise linear, and boom, it fits right inside the carpet. What about the canasta continuum? You see that in the carpet? And I'll look right along the middle line there. Right, the intersection of that horizontal line is just the canter middle third set. So I can again make this piecewise linear and fit right in. Right? Draw that line, go to x equals one, x equals two thirds, one third, two ninths, seven ninths, eight ninths, one ninth, the twenty sevenths. <coughs> A firsts, and on and on and on. I can draw that one exterior curve we saw earlier in the carpet right inside the inclosed tumor of it, right inside the Shapinsky carpet, and now close that up and do that. The canasta continuum, and it's inside the set because it's closed. So yeah, the canasta continuum fits in there. But those are pretty simple curves. There's much more complicated curves out there. Here's my favorite one. And I need my boat, my dog. And you can post a continuum, my house. All the integers I know, all the letters I know, several people in the audience. The paper I recently wrote. <laughs> That's a curve in the plane that fits. Only more I could manipulate it, so it fits inside the Shapinsky carpet. Necessarily gets there. The Shapinsky carpet is a dictionary of all possible planar curves. Okay, now let's go back to the lambda of the n plus z of the n plus lambda of z of the n. Here's some easy to verify facts. If you go out near infinity, right, uh, if z is large and this term is negligible, your function is just like z of the n. So you have an immediate base of infinity. On the other hand, zero is a pole, so you have a neighborhood of zero that's mapped to the basin of infinity. We call that the trap door. Okay. And you can compute that there's two n critical points 
given by lambda to the one over two mass. It looks like the huge number of critical points. Not good to give you quadratic polynomials where you have one. For the exponential, we have one over the guy. But in fact, it's, it's really only one critical orbit due to symmetry. Okay, what I should say is these two n critical points all map onto one of two critical values that either then map onto the same point or behave symmetrically. So essentially, we really have only one critical orbit in the symmetry. So this is just like polynomial, the quadratic polynomial choice, or the exponential, though it's different, it's rational. And now the junior set is a little different. Instead of being a closure of the escaping points, it's now the boundary of the escaping points, just as in the polynomial case. It's the escaping points in the base of the infinity part of the junior set. Okay, now the computation of the junior sets is done exactly as before. I'll color points to escape to infinity, shades of red, orange, yellow, da da da. Those colored points now are not in the junior set. I'll color points black that do not escape to infinity. So the Julia set is now the boundary 